behavior. The studies all show alcohol leads disproportionately to reckless, violent behavior. Whereas marijuana, the last thing you want to do is get in a fight with a bunch of guys in a bar. Okay? I mean, you know, remembering my younger days, you want to eat sour cream and onion potato chips and listen to the doors. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe your experience is different. But, um, so, you know, plus marijuana, there's all the ancillary problems with it. There are the, you know, the fact that we make people go to, uh, you know, basically criminals behind a bowling alley to buy marijuana that they don't know the potency of, they don't know if it's laced with something else, they don't know the safety of. And they're forced to be, you know, behind the bowling alley in the dark. And I got a letter from the bowling alley industry. I apologize. Uh, it's just a metaphor, okay? Uh, but, <clears throat> but, you know, whereas if you want to buy booze, you walk into a well-lit store in the strip mall uh, where it's totally safe. You buy a bottle of Grey Goose, you know what you're getting, you know the potency, you know it's safe. All right. Um, so all all of these things um, are 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 you know obvious reasons that prohibition has been. Not to mention the lives it's destroying. I got to tell you, and I'll, I'll get a little of the reaction I get. This blinking. You you all can hear me, right? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, the the uh, you know in Pennsylvania we arrest twenty five thousand people a year approximately <laughs> marijuana. We spend about three hundred fifty million dollars a year prosecuting. And we leave several hundred million more, depending on how you tax it, on the table that we could be using for schools and everything like that. In Pennsylvania, in the last year, we cut off all cash assistance to poor people, 100 percent eliminated. Um, we've cut, we eliminated the program Adult Basic, which, which gave uh, low-income people opportunities who didn't qualify for Medicaid opportunities to get health insurance. We've done a whole lot of relief. We cut 800 million from our schools. Okay. And when we had a school district that couldn't pay its teachers, and actually the only time I ever met with the governor, the only, the only time I ever meet with him uh, personally, um, he said, yeah, I'm like, we got to give some money to the school. He said, I wish I had money. I have no money. There's no money to be found anywhere. Gosh, where can we find money? Of course, a week later, he found 11 million for voter ID. Okay, but putting that aside, <laughs> all right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, disenfranchising people is important. We have to prioritize it. But, no money. Here's hundreds of millions of dollars for you, Governor. Uh, you know, and, and, and no interest at all. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, the, the argument is so compelling. Uh, so we introduced the bill, and it was very interesting because, again, I've introduced a lot of controversial bills over the years. Often, they break down along partisan lines. The opposition is predictably, you know, conservative Republicans don't like my legislation. All right? Uh, often. Uh, this was very different. And, and it's been a, a, an amazing thing because um, it doesn't break down along those lines. Uh, I've had very, very conservative legislators come up to me and say, <coughs> "We're I'm 100% behind you. I can't say that publicly. Don't quote me. But I'm 100% behind you, okay? I have one conservative senator, I won't mention the person's name, but people in Pennsylvania who know the Senate would be shocked to hear it, say to me, I wish your bill would pass. That means I could smoke it on my porch instead of my living room. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you did hear about the big pro prohibition legislator who was busted with pot. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 I love those Hypocrite. stories. I love those Hypocrite. stories. Remember there's a homophobic guy who was busted like with three dudes and a <laughs> 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 my favorite kind of story in the world. <laughs> Just keep in mind, I mean, there are a lot of liberal arguments for any prohibition, but there's also, you know, there's three kinds of conservatives I have met. And there's some overlap, but there's economic conservatives. If you're an economic conservative, you can't be for prohibition, because prohibition is just another, go another government program, okay? And it costs too much money, and the taxpayers aren't getting anything for it. So that's number one. Number two, there's the libertarian conservatives. I don't want, no, I don't want government telling me what to do, all right? Well, you can't be for prohibition if you're that. Um, and the third kind is the social conservative, the, the, the uh, evangelical conservative, the person who lives in terror that someone somewhere may be having fun. That person, <laughs> that type of conservative, that they do oppose that because, you know, again, someone might be having fun. But they're pro-alcohol. What's that? Those people are pro-alcohol. No. They would not bring right. back alcohol program. Uh, yeah, although they do, I mean, one of the, they, they actually, they do, they're against things like, um, Sell, in Pennsylvania, you can't sell alcohol in grocery stores. Right. So uh, they're against expanding alcohol sales to grocery stores, most of them. I mean, there's a lot of inconsistency in all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it, it, and 
then the letters I started getting, again, are, were very, very, a lot of very, very conservative Republicans were very, very supportive of me. To the point where I said to the newspaper that if, and I believe this with all my heart, if this could come before the legislature on a secret ballot, it would pass. All right? Now it can't, but if it could, it would pass. Which, which suggests a lack of courage on the part of legislators. Um, and, and, you know, when I say courage, just let me say, I don't really mean courage because, I mean, you know, courage is based on rational fears. And many of these people, there is no rational fear for, for their unwillingness to say what they support. Okay? I, I mean, because of gerrymandering in, in, in Pennsylvania and because of incumbent protection, there, m most members of the House and Senate, particularly the Senate, in the Senate, one person has lost a general election. One se incumbent senator has lost a general election in the last 60 years. One. Okay? And that is because uh, it was this district was moving just ideologically very much against them. But, I mean, no one's ever... I mean, no one's ever lost, it's been decades since someone's lost because of something they said, all right? Most of these people couldn't lose if they were indicted for treason, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Just so you understand. But yet they're terrified, okay? And so I've been trying to explore what it, what it is about marijuana that you can't, like, what, what is the, because really, it, it's, 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 it's not the sort of issue that structurally, should cause people to have this much fear. It's not a tax increase, which, you know, people are concerned about supporting because it takes money out of people's pockets and things like that. This doesn't affect people at all unless they want to be affected by it, all right? Uh, that sort of thing structurally should not cause people to have that much fear. What is it? And I, I, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. I'll give you my thought, which is that marijuana has become tied into the culture war. And that happened largely in the 60s. And so when people think of marijuana smokers now, people, when I say people, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of rigid conservatives who oppose what I'm doing, uh, when they think of that, they, th they, th they think of a person who looks like Jimi Hendrix, you know, um, smoking weed and burning an American flag and being against the war and being for abortion or other stuff, you know, like they have this this image in their minds, okay? Um, and I, as, as I've said, the average marijuana smoker now is less likely to look like Jimi Hendrix, more likely to look like Dick Cheney, okay? <laughs> Middle aged, you know, person comes home after work, wants to take the edge off a little bit instead of a cocktail, he has a joint. So, um, one of the things you have to do, I think, over time, what all all of us have to do, what our task is is to sort of decouple this image of marijuana, the, the, the actual merits of the discussion of marijuana legalization from the sort of knee-jerk, visceral, reptilian brain, <laughs> um, you know, uh, image that people have of it in certain parts of the country and in certain age groups. I think that's a real problem. What do people say to me when we debate this issue? Uh, the big thing I always get, and this is just, uh, uh, this just drives me crazy because you know, there are, I, when you do, when you deal with an argument long enough, you start understanding the physics of the argument, and so you, you sort of, you know, you sort of know all a angles of and all aspects of it. And so, I think I understand the physics of this issue pretty well. And and so, there's a few, and there's a few arguments that drive me crazy because they just, you know, on so many levels are faulty. The, the most common, can we guess what the most common argument? Kids. Well, no, no, I'll get to the kids. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. Terrorism. Kids is number two. Number one is gateway drug. It's a <laughs> gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Now, <laughs> let's talk just briefly, and then no. people can shut me up when I'm talking. Um, let's talk briefly about how messed up, I'm trying to not use bad language. Um, Go for it. That, that, <laughs> argue, <laughs> how that argument is. All right? First of all, what does that even mean? What does it mean? Does it mean if I smoke marijuana, I will instantly, like, give me heroin? Where is heroin? <laughs> I got to, you know, or is it because, because that, that's interesting, all right? It, or is it because, is the theory that I'll smoke marijuana, but because I'm buying marijuana from a criminal in a, in a different element, that I'm going to be exposed to heroin or other things? Well, I mean, if that's your theory, then you should be against prohibition, because, again, you know, no one, when I go to the state store and buy my bottle of Grey Goose, the, the, it's very rare that the person behind the counter can say,
state store says, here you go, sir. By the way, I have some cocaine, too, if you're interested. <laughs> All right. That doesn't really happen, does it? But if I'm buying it, you know, again, behind the proverbial bowling alley, that could happen. So if you believe that's the theory, um, then, then, and then how would you even measure that? Would you measure it that people who smoke marijuana are more, li uh, are more likely, are, are people who use heroin or are, have used marijuana in the past? Is that how you measure whether it's a gateway drug? Or whether or not people who use marijuana are more likely to use? It's in the reverse of the same thing. I hope I'm articulating this. Well, all right, so let me, let me tell you what the study said. There's a recent study from the Yale, you may know it, and it's consistent with other studies that they took a bunch of people who used meth and heroin and harder drugs, and they asked them, have you smoked marijuana? 34% of them said they had smoked marijuana, okay? And so, I was on a TV show once and said, at some point in the site said, aha, not having read the whole study, of course. They said, aha, 30, that's proof. 34% of them had used marijuana before. Now, I pointed out, and you've all I'm sure heard this, that 100% of them had drank milk before. <laughs> okay, so whether there is a, because there is a, you know, a, a time uh, uh, sequence, there's a causation, that isn't at all proven. But, but what the study also says is, putting milk aside, 34% had smoked marijuana, 56% had smoked cigarettes, and 57% had drank alcohol. So if marijuana is a gateway drug by that measure, it's a bad one. It's an ineffective one, and it's not nearly as good as products that are perfectly legal. So if, if your argument is that, you, that it's a gateway drug, we should, you should, and you, we should ban gateway drugs, we should reinstate prohibition. If you don't want to reinstate alcohol prohibition, and this is true of almost every argument, then you have no argument for sustaining prohibition on marijuana. The other argument I get all the time is, uh, oh, by the way, the other side of that argument is the overwhelming majority of people who smoke marijuana well into the 90s never use harder drugs. I, I never, I smoked marijuana when I was younger. Uh, I never, uh, I was a coward, I was, a, you know, I, I didn't, I never wanted to try anything else uh, other than alcohol. Um, you know, whip it. I don't think that's even, is that considered a harder drug? I don't know. <laughs> but, but, um, I was up. It was like a great concert of balloons. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, but, so, th so it is not, there is no statistical, scientific evidence that it's a gateway drug at all. So that's number one. Number two is the children. And this is where people lose their ability to think critically. Um, uh, and, and at all, because what we all, uh, I get, I get this. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten that are versions of this. <coughs> do you want your children? Yes, I do. I have two children, uh, almost ten and twelve. Okay. Um, do you want your children riding on a school bus with a driver who's stoned? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also don't want my drive my my kids riding on a bus with a driver who's drunk. Right. Okay. Or a driver who's like hopped up on Percocet. Okay. Or a driver who's lots of other things. Okay. Uh, but we don't ban those things. All right. What we do is we make it illegal to drive on alcohol. It is already illegal to drive on marijuana. The blood levels are my bill that I passed 10 years ago. Um, and so, again, there's, there's the structure of that argument just doesn't sustain itself in the face of the fact that we have <coughs> toxicants which are worse and are illegal. Okay, um, and uh, then of course I just get the people who don't have an argument at all. They just lash out at me. You're just a stoner. <laughs> um, you know I have actually haven't smoked marijuana for a long, long time. Uh, you know I try, I'm trying to be healthy, and I think pouring hot gas over your lungs probably isn't a good idea. Doesn't help my running. Um, uh, you know, nor does my uh, love of onion rings help my running. But I mean, uh, you know, so I don't, you know, I'm, I, that's not why, this isn't about me getting access to pot, okay? But this is about the fact that we're destroying lives. I gotta tell you, when I was at a judicial conference, and I won't name names here either, but I was at a judicial conference in St. Martin. They always have such cool places, so I go. So, they, um, and there was four Supreme Court justices there, several Republican Supreme Court justices, came up to me again, 100% they agree. I had many lower court judges just who said to me, a couple of them told me stories, that there was a, you know, a, a kid accepted to a great college, sold his buddy a joint, 
got taught, the college withdrew the acceptance. That kid's academic career is permanently uh, sidetracked. All right? And there's people who can't get jobs because of these marijuana arrests. There's people who are arrested, they're never even sentenced sentenced to jail for low-grade offenses, but they serve jail time because they're arrested. They can't make bail or some probation violation for something a long time ago unrelated. So, um, you know, uh, the judges who actually deal with that, a lot of them were like, this is, you know, obviously we got to do. So what's the, what are the prospects for the future? And any questions anyone has? Um, uh, what I always say is short term, it's a tough fight, particularly the governor who is not a deep thinker on this issue. Um, <laughs> Uh, Governor Corbett, who decided to veto any bill with the word marijuana in it, essentially, you know, <coughs> medical, you know, anything. I just because it's a gate. I no, he he says this. It's even more offensive. He says he doesn't say it's a gateway drug. He says I believe it's a gateway drug. <laughs> I mean, my kid believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> I mean, no, really, it's kind of embarrassing now because most kids are no longer believe in Santa Claus. But I thought it was cute like three years ago to hire some dude dress up in Santa Claus at like in the one in the morning on Christmas Eve. I'm Jewish, it's another story. But anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, they've actually seen Santa Claus, you see. So they now continue to believe well past when they appropriately should. And as a result, they're getting the crap beat out of the school. But that's, that's uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, people believe all kinds of, I mean, but just the fact that he would say on such an important issue, not that I'm the former Attorney General, and I've seen the studies, and I can tell you, because there are no such studies. I believe it's a gateway drug. Well, what do you do with that? I mean, you know, what do you do with subjective belief without evidence? I mean, I, there's, there's nowhere to go with that. Um, uh, but anyway, he won't be there forever. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, we, there will be a new governor, perhaps sooner than later. So, uh, in the short term, this is a battle. As, especially for the reasons we've talked about, because people are afraid. In the long term, it's inevitable. Why is it inevitable? Number one, demographics. Okay, as you know, young people, and I tell my conservative friends, I'm like, talk to, conserv talk to young conservatives, not liberals, talk to young conservatives, 25, 20. They have no interest in prohibition, okay? Uh, th this is a dead policy. It's a dead policy walk, okay? Because every day, a supporter of prohibition goes to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and an opponent of prohibition is born. Yeah. All right, so that over time uh, will be helpful. So um, number, one, number two is exposure. The same thing with marriage equality. It's exposure. Because what happens is you, you paint these horrible stories about, oh my God, you'll be, there'll be all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, long-haired, stone clone like zombies running around the, the world um, if we do this. Um, and then like, California does what they've done, and Colorado and Washington do what they do. And people say, you know what? That didn't happen. Turns out that the rate of illegal drug use did not go up, and the rate of drug addiction has actually gone down. Turns out they're saving hundreds of millions of dollars, blah, blah, blah. I mean, and you look at the, uh, the, the, the examples of places where it's already been longer, like Portugal and other places in Europe, where, I mean, it's just, life is so much better, you know, and they see that. And what's really going to drive this issue, frankly, is money. You know, 30, 40 years ago, there was, there was only one place you could gamble in America, because it was the big sin, you know. It was uh, Las Vegas, and that was it. Now there's gambling in 48 states, okay? There's a, there's a casino a mile from my house, all right? So, uh, you know, over time, people are even <laughs> conservative are going to be like, you know what? This is just too tempting to, you know, to carry on uh, with what we're doing. So this is inevitable in the long term. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is, since it's inevitable, is bring closer the day that it happens. Because, frankly, uh, every day where this goes on is an injustice. Every day that this goes <coughs> on, lives are being destroyed. Uh, and so we're hoping to have hearings on this. Let everyone come in. Let all sides come in. Let them testify. And let, you know, let's, let's, let's really <coughs> scrutinize the reasons behind this. Um, so with that, uh, you know, uh, please thank you for not only having me today, but for the fight you're waging. It's very important. People say to me sometimes, this is some kind of fringe issue, or why, are, why is this our top priority? And first of all, it's not, not my, obviously my only issue, but it's not a fringe issue. 
It's an issue that is involves tens of thousands of lives every year. It's an issue that involves billions of dollars every year. Uh, and, and, and it's just, you know, it's something that's, that, that has to stop if we're going to ever progress as a, as a society <coughs> as we should. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions at all. Oh, Jesus. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. What? Yeah, I, I mean, we haven't seen that yet cause I, in Pennsylvania, because I don't think they feel they have to yet. Um, the, uh, you know, and then the more we privatize things like prisons, the more we create uh, a, a, an economic uh, uh, establishment who opposes not only the end of prohibition, but any effort to reduce the number of inmates, which is, you would think that's just like morally horrific, uh, but <laughs> that's just the way the world works, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's something we, have, we definitely have to look out for. Yeah. Those lots to legalization uh, through prohibition, for the state of Pennsylvania, that's a long haul, that's a hard haul. Why aren't we looking more towards the industrialization act and focus <coughs> on the difference between hemp and marijuana? Because what we want to do is to gain the public awareness and public acceptance, and industrial hemp would be a cleaner way for uh, public acceptance. We started a coalition in Pittsburgh towards this end for not for profit and reaching out to farmers. And it could be more focused from the economic standpoint to revitalize farms and agriculture, which is what Pennsylvania is more geared to. Well, I mean, look, you know, again, if there's anything more of a no-brainer than allowing the growth of a cannabis plant that doesn't make you high, uh, I can't imagine. What, I mean, you can smoke a whole hemp field and not get high. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, but it still won't pass because it has the word marijuana in it. And, and you're like, what are you talking about? These are adults. These are grown men and women. Of course, that's you know, they're not that dumb. But uh, it, it's not a question of dumb. It's a question of there's a there's just a there, there's a so the guy up here who was talking about all the stuff I can understand before, um, <laughs> but he's talking about receptors. There, there is no receptor for, for, for that. So, so, and that's not my issue. My issue, what I do, and it's what I did with marriage equality, what I did with a bunch of other issues, is I introduce a bill because because lesser bills can be introduced by people who are less 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 reckless with their careers. Um, uh, I'll say a word about that in a second, but um, the, the, the um, you know, I, I introduced the bill that I would like to see become law. In other words, I introduced the bill that reflects the law as I'd like to see it. And the law as I would like to see it in this context is that marijuana is legal um, for all purposes. So, you know, you have, under my bill you have to be 21, you can't do it while you're drunk, you, have, you can't do it. Anything that applies to uh, alcohol would apply to marijuana. Any the the smoking ban in restaurants would apply to marijuana, just like it applies to cigarettes. You know, it, it would be responsible. But I want to see the law where no one's going to jail for for, for using marijuana. That's what I'd like to see. And and what I do is I give other people the opportunity to introduce a lesser bill, like a bill like, well, let's just do hemp, and say, and and it gives legislators cover. They can say, all right, I'm for the hemp bill. I'm not for that crazy leech bill. No, I'm not for that. But I'm for the hemp bill. So, um, you know, but that's my role. My role is to introduce the law as, as I think it should be, right. and then hopefully others will work uh, more towards it. Let me just say a word about the politics, by the way. Um, I don't know if anyone here is interested in politics or running for office or whatever. There we go. Um, you're not my district, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, I am, uh, I have found, if you say a political word here for me, uh, I have found counterintuitively that that doing things that are unpopular is actually very good politics. I mean, within reason. I mean, you know, lowering the age of consent to six is probably not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, uh, whatever. I mean, you don't want to be crazy. But doing things that are unpopular but, but reason <coughs> is actually really good politics. Because people are much more interested in your general, in what their perceptions of your general character are than they are in the specifics of your voting record. And so <coughs> getting a reputation of someone who's willing to do when things are unpopular is actually good politics. And I went, I got my, my last election, I got almost 70% of the vote in the district that was the most Republican district in the state 20 years ago, but, but is now, I mean, it's just, you know, 
Um, it's all, not all my boyish charm, you know, some of it is that. Um, and now, I'm not, this is not a campaign speech, but now uh, I am, you know, running for Congress now. And there is a... Um, and a I'll move into the 13th district. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, but, but um, you know, that's another thing. Like, people, why would you introduce this, knowing that might happen, like months before your, like that's exactly. And yesterday was uh, two days ago. I introduced genetically modified foods bill, uh, yeah. labeling bill. So it, it, <laughs> if I pull back now and just start introducing, you know, resolutions commemorating the. The, the contribution of the woodchuck to Pennsylvania Terminus or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a terrible idea. So uh, be, be free, feel free to be, you know, bold and, and stuff. I actually think it's really good politics. Um, number three. Sir, my name is Mike Ryder. I'm from Pennsylvania Veterans for Marijuana Legalization. Um, my question is... Is there an acronym to that? <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> um, my question was about... Uh, <laughs> you weren't smoking it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your bill uh, does not contain an amnesty uh, clause. Um, have you thought about amnesty for people that are in prison now? Yeah. Um, no, you know what? I have it in great detail. This is the problem. And there's other things it doesn't contain. For example, my bill does not contain a tax rate. For the, for the marijuana. My bill does not contain um, a dedicated... Uh, res re someone said, you know, why don't you say that the money will go for schools? In other words, a dedicated receptor of the tax money. There's a lot of things we discussed and debated. One of the things in legislation you have to try to do is not make your bill do too much. Uh, because the more it does, the more you, <coughs> you get opposition from ancillary stuff. So, for example, you know, if you say, well, it's going to go for schools, that sounds great, except the people who wanted to go to roads are going to be all pissed now. They're not going to support your bill. So, um, I think that it's a two, I think once it becomes legal, and it's very rare that we make something illegal legal, but I think once something becomes legal, the pressure to stop punishing the people who did it before it was legal becomes overwhelming. I think that's more likely to be a successful route for those people than to put it in the initial bill, which will, you know, because then they can take the worst person who's in jail for a marijuana offense, someone who looks like, you know, remember the mud man or whatever, you know, <laughs> someone who looks like, you know, they have four extra chromosomes, and they'll say, he wants to let that guy out of jail, all right? Uh, he'll come and eat your kids and whatever. And so, um, we try not to give, you know, we try to overdo with the bill. Well, I think what the bill does is, aggressive enough, <coughs> and then if it, w when it does pass, <coughs> I think some of this other stuff will just fall into place. Yes, sir? Well, I, I, it's unclear. There will be some litigation about that, potentially. Oh. This is my view of the, uh, and no, it won't happen this year. But this is my view of the state-federal relationship. All we're saying, we're not flaunting federal law, which I don't support. What we are saying is, it is no longer a state crime, which means that we will not prosecute you for it. Okay. Now, um, if the Attorney General of the United States wants to come in and prosecute someone for possession of three joints, they can still do that. They don't do that. And the president has said that's not going to be what they do. So uh, a future president may change their mind, but they're not going to have the resources to do that. But they still could on a, like, make an example of every once in a while type of situation. All we're saying is we're not, we're not participating in that. We're not using state resources to arrest and prosecute people. You want to send the feds in, you know, and, 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 and the FBI to bust someone for having, you know, three joints, then go ahead. That's, that's, that's it. Yes?
it, it's, it's, it's multifaceted, time consuming, labor intensive, and difficult. Because, I mean, it's great that you, you know, you, if you gin up 100 emails, they're going to think there are 100 ginned up emails, especially if they're all identical. We get that all the time. Um, that's not really going to be the most helpful thing. I mean, it's fine, but it's not <coughs> going to change people's minds. What's going to change people's minds is polling, which means actual people, you know, the population changing. And that, we did a poll recently, and while a majority of Pennsylvanians still support prohibition, it's uh, legalization has gained 31 points in 10 years. Okay? That is a train, that is the train that will eventually knock over opposition. And when we see what happens in Colorado, when the voters, not a court, you know, not, you know, the voters in Colorado and Washington said we're tired of prohibition. And then if there's other states that do that, uh, that will, that's something that people will take notice of. So you gotta change the minds of the people. I found, you know, let me tell you, people ask why I'm running for Congress. One of the things is because, you know, I'm doing some stuff in the state Senate, I'm like, the issues come up, I study the issue, I come up with a great argument, I, I give a, what I perceive to be a really eloquent speech on the floor, and it changes no votes. And I've learned in politics, it's not about changing votes. Four, five, six, sorry, put your hands. Uh, it's not about changing votes when you give a speech, or do what you do. It's about changing the public's opinion, not the other legislators. That's a hopeless cause. Changing the public's opinion, that's what will change the other legislators. Uh, and then, number two, uh, win more elections. That's, my, that's the key three word mantra of any political movement. Win more elections. Get candidates, confront candidates, particularly in primaries, and say, you know, do you support this? All right? And, and work hard to elect the people who do. Um, whichever primary might happen to be happening on May 20th of this coming year. Uh, four. <laughs> Not this coming year. Yes. It was me. Four. Me? Yes. Um, I am not a political creature, so I'm not sure, but you had mentioned public hearings for your, your legislation. How does that work? How do you get involved with Well, that? we're going to have two kinds. We're going to have, there's two potential hearings, and we're, we can definitely have one. There's, by, uh, uh, there's, there's 22 standing committees. The chairperson of the standing committee can call a hearing and set a date, people come and testify. Uh, this bill has not been referred to a committee yet. Uh, which is odd because it's been introduced for weeks now. Um, but anyway, it's either going to go to health or possibly consumer affairs or possibly state government. And then we go try to get the chair of that committee to hold a, a hearing. Now, he, he or she won't. Each party has their own policy committee where they can call hearings. So uh, I could get the Democratic Policy Committee to have a hearing. Uh, and if we can't get the bipartisan committee, we're going to do that. Uh, but we will have a hearing on it, and it will be very interesting. And you know what happens with these hearings is they always bring, and not to de not to uh, dismiss <coughs> the tragedies individual people have, but they'll always bring someone because I've seen these before do this with medical marijuana. They'll bring someone in whose son, you know, smoked marijuana and then did meth and then got in a powerful car accident and died. You know, but you know. The number, if I wanted to get the number of people who've been in horrible car accidents, not as a result of someone doing something which may or may not have led to something else, which, I, you know, I could call in how many people a year for alcohol? Mm -hmm. You know, tens of thousands of people a year for alcohol to tell their tragic stories, but we're not reinstating prohibition. It's like these arguments don't go to the point that they're trying to make. They're sad, but they don't go to the point. Uh, of whether prohibition is appropriate. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry, number five. Okay. Well, all right, Dan, this is Les Stark. Uh, I was going to say, uh, well, I had about, you know, 100 thoughts as you're talking. But um, in, in, La it. <laughs> yeah, in Lancaster, uh, I had a protest uh, back in um, December. It was a rally. And one of the things we did was I, I, I wanted to get good speakers. So I got a, self, uh, or a defense attorney, Richard McDonald, his name was. And before the rally, he told me that he was trying to spread the word to uh, people he knew. And his circle of friends is like people like the judges, prosecuting attorneys, law enforcement, all these people. And he said, I got to tell you, that they are not impressed. But well, anyway, he gave, he gave the greatest speech at the rally. And, and uh, it was awesome. And we had great coverage. We made the front page of the Sunday newspaper. He told me uh, after the rally that he went back into the courthouse to work. 
and he said that the sheriffs were standing at attention and saluting him. He said we set the whole courthouse a buzz. So we got his whole, basically everybody in the law enforcement. And Lancaster County, you know, is one of the, the most conservative places in the thing. I think it is possible to get uh, support. And just one other real quick thing you said about people uh, not uh, look, they don't look like Jimi Hendrix nowadays. People, they look more like Dick Cheney. Has ever anyone, anybody ever uh, indicated to you that you look a little bit like Dick Cheney? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I, I have a cousin. I have a cousin who uh, <laughs> uh, is named Sefton. We like unusual names in my family. And uh, they always say that my cousin Sefton is like Tom Cruise gorgeous. I'm more Dick Cheney gorgeous. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm great. Um, I was wondering if you could give a quick synopsis of what your your bill does. And in answer to one of the previous questions, you were talking about not going into states and going after users. My understanding is that your bill does set up some sort of regulation and distribution system. Yeah? Yeah, is that correct? Correct. I mean, that is the area where you know there's a, a, a very good chance that the federal government is going to say this is you know, in conflict with the Controlled Substances Act and this violates our treaty obligations under the single convention. That's the concern. You know, it's, it's black letter law. The states have the ability to set their own criminal laws and not penalize conduct. It's, it's the regulation and distribution that they may go after. Well, and that's the second point. Because first of all, if you're going to have a legalization regimen, regime, you got to have some right, sort of distribution of system. So there is now some controversy as to whether or not the federal government uh, can or will um, interfere with that distribution system in a state that has chosen to drop criminal pro uh, uh, prohibitions because of the necessity of having some regime. If they're not going to be prosecuting it, and we don't have the re resources to prosecute it, how do we distribute it? I mean, there, there, there has to be some way. There's no default option. Um, and so what I chose to do, and I'm not married to this, but uh, again, trying to do as little as possible with the bill, there we have a state store system in Pennsylvania. I'm not getting involved for purposes of this discussion to whether or not we should have a state store system, but we do, okay? So it is a, it, it is a pre-existing structure where people can, where they're already trained to uh, deal with intoxicants, to check ID, to accept ta pay taxes. So I would just plug into that initially. Um, and so it would be sold in state stores. Uh, now, um, over time, especially if state stores aren't around anymore, you'd have to come up with a different system, in which case, to me, I'm a, you know, as a free market guy, you know, you have licensed uh, places that could sell it, distribute it, that are inspected and they're, they're, they're above board, and they would be privately owned. You could also get something to eat there. You could also, you know, would get, get a drink there, whatever it is. So it'd be like marijuana bars almost, um, or maybe regular bars that were licensed. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, you know, there, there's a bunch of different ways you can go on that. What I wanted to do was start the conversation about legalization um, without, without getting too into the weeds of what, you know, the bill would actually do in terms of the other stuff. Because really, once we get the big thing done, the other stuff will take care of itself. Uh, I don't, am I done? Uh, yeah, that'll be our last question. That'll be our last question. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much. <laughs>